In this video about the arterial blood gas lab, the ABG, I'm going to start with an introduction to the basic concepts uh, about an ABG, and then I will talk about the, the components individually and their normal values, followed by how to interpret the numbers or in the interpretation of the ABG. Then I'll give you some examples, and we'll finish off with some knowledge challenge questions. All right, let's do it. So the first thing I want to point out, guys, is that an ABG is an arterial blood gas test. So why is that important? Basically because most of the time in the clinic or the urgent care or ER, your access point to the patient is an IV, an intravenous line, not an arterial line. So while you could pull blood from that IV and send it to the lab, the results that you got back would be a VBG not an ABG, okay? And it's for that reason that most often times the ABG is used in critical care settings like an ICU or somewhere like that where a team has come in and, and gotten arterial access which is more difficult than venous access. In less critical settings like the clinic, the pulse oximetry is used more frequently just because it's less invasive by far, it's faster and definitely cheaper. An ABG is important because it gives us an idea about what's dissolved in the blood and also for acid base homeostasis. This is important because our bodies are extremely sensitive to swings in the pH. One of the most important things that could happen is denaturing of proteins. Now that doesn't mean that they're going to completely unfold, it just means that they're not going to function like they should and you're, you're just going to feel miserable. Um, it's for this reason that our pH in our bodies is highly, highly regulated, and that's done by two main systems, the, the respiratory system and the renal system, which I cover in this lecture. If you want to learn a little bit more about buffering agents, check out one of the links in the YouTube cards. The first thing that I want to talk about is the respiratory system. And I think it's pretty easy to understand why the respiratory system has a big effect on the amounts of gases dissolved in my blood. And the reason is because, hey, I mean, th these are my lungs. They deal with gases all day long, right? But what about the pH? Why do the lungs have an effect on the pH? And the answer to that is found in carbon dioxide. You see, carbon dioxide, when dissolved in the blood, is able to transform or shift to carbonic acid, which is the same thing that you see in a fizzy, um, a fizzy soda pop. It's the fizz. It's the dissolved carbon dioxide, which turns into acid and then can uh, re-express from the liquid in a gas form. So if I decrease the amount of carbon dioxide in my blood, then I decrease the amount of carbonic acid. And you can taste that in a soda pop. If a soda pop has been sitting out for a long time and has lost all its fizz, it tastes really too sweet. And the reason is, is because it's not counterbalanced by that acidic taste, which kind of neutralizes the sweetness. So if I were to hyperventilate for a minute or two, I would ventilate off or degas my blood of carbon dioxide and therefore decrease the amount of carbonic acid and then therefore increase the pH or make my, my blood more uh, alkalotic. The converse is also true. If I stop breathing for a period of time, I can increase the acidity or decrease the pH of my blood. And this is a pretty fast response. If I were to hyperventilate for a few minutes, um, you would be able to notice a difference in the pH of my blood. It happens pretty quickly. Now, all of this applies to an ABG with the term respiratory compensation. And what that means is, um, let's say that I have a disease process in my body that's causing my blood to be too acidic. Well, normal physiology, the, the respiratory compensation would be for me to breathe faster. This happens automatically, it's normal physiology. I would breathe faster to degas or ventilate off carbon dioxide and that would decrease the amount of carbonic acid and bring my pH closer to normal. Okay, and again, that's a fast process. This is normal physiology and it's called respiratory compensation and we'll talk a little bit more about it later on. Okay, let's, let's move on. The second system that I wanna talk about that's important for the ABG is the renal system. 
The renal system can change the amount of dissolved substances in the blood by how much the nephrons retain or secrete um, those molecules of interest. And in this case, for pH, we're interested in bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. Bicarbonate is a base and hydrogen ions uh, are acidic. So if the renal tubular cells retained bicarb, this is the second bullet point, they held on to bicarb, and they secreted more hydrogen ions, then the blood would become more alkalotic. Does that make sense? If we're holding on to base and secreting acid, then the, the, the blood would become more alkalotic. And the converse is also true. If we secreted or dumped off all the base into the urine and held on to all the acid, then our blood would become more acidic. Now, opposite to the respiratory system, the renal system is a little bit slower. It takes more time to change the acidity of urine and to make any meaningful contribution by the production of different pHs of urine. But it still makes a huge response. And in fact, this is a more long-lasting response. It's just a little bit slower in getting its wheels turning. And this is called the metabolic compensation. So... You remember how I just said the previous one was the respiratory compensation? Unfortunately, it can't be easy. It can't be renal compensation. We call it metabolic compensation. So if I have a disease process uh, in, my, uh, in my body that is causing my blood to be too acidic, the metabolic compensation, the normal physiology would be for me to retain bicarb and thus neutralize the acid or bring the pH closer to normal, thus compensating for this um, disease process that was causing the, the, the acidity. So now that I've kind of described the two main systems that have a big effect on the pH and the dissolved substances in the blood, the respiratory system and the renal system, let me introduce you to how you start to interpret an ABG. And first off, this is the fishbone. This is the shorthand for an ABG. And it's literally just numbers separated by slashes. And you just have to know what each number means. I've given you a this white picture here in the middle is how it might appear on your soap note. You know, it's just, it's just numbers separated by slashes. How do you remember what each number means? That's what this mnemonic is for. Hot cocoa in bed. The first H for hot is for the pH, and then in cocoa, each of those four letters represents something. So the first C is for the partial pressure of arterial carbon dioxide. The first O is for the partial pressure of arterial oxygen, and then bicarb, and then O2 sat, as in the saturation of hemoglobin. And then the BE is uh, for the base excess, okay? Let's jump into each one of these numbers and talk about what they mean and also what their normal values are. Starting off with the first value, this is the pH. This is the direct measurement of the acidity or alkalinity of the blood. And the normal values are between 7.35 and 7.45. And I, I like the numbers 3.5 and 4.5 because you see those numbers in the normal values of a lot of different um, laboratory tests. Like for example, in the BMP, okay, the, the normal sodium values is between 135 and 145, or the normal potassium is between 3.5 and 4.5. So you can use 3.5 and 4.5 over and over again to memorize normal values. And by the way, if you need to look up a BMP or get a video on that, or the CBC or other labs, Go in the upper right-hand corner and check out the, the links that I've given you in the YouTube cards. Um, next, the PaCO2, which is the partial pressure of arterial carbon dioxide. Um, the normal values between 3.5 and 4.5. There's my favorite numbers again. This is used to assess the respiratory component of acid-base regulation. What does that mean? Well, I talked a little bit about respiratory compensation or the respiratory, the respiratory component a couple of slides ago. Remember, the carbon dioxide in your blood shifts between carbon dioxide and carbonic acid. So when this number goes up, when the PaCO2 goes up, there is more carbonic acid in your blood. Your blood is more acidic. And when that number goes down, um, 
the opposite is also true, okay? So this is the respiratory component. The PA, PaO2 is the partial pressure of arterial oxygen, and this is an indirect measurement of your patient's oxygenation status. Now, um, because this is um, not talking about hemoglobin, this is just the amount of oxygen that is dissolved in the serum, the liquid portion of your blood, and that is not enough oxygen to support metabolism. You can't live on the oxygen that is dissolved in your serum. Uh, hemoglobin, the hemoglobin and red blood cell system carries way, way more oxygen, tons more. Um, this is just an indirect measurement of how much uh, oxygen is diffusing with the atmosphere or transferring back and forth, okay? So this is, um, it's kind of an indirect measurement. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. The next one is the bicarb, HCO3 is the bicarb. Normal values there between 22 and 26. Remember, this was the, the renal system or the metabolic component, the metabolic compensation of acid-base problems in your body. If you are too acidic, your kidneys will automatically, automatically retain this bicarb, thus neutralizing or helping to neutralize the acidic disease process because bicarb is a base. The next one is the oxygen saturation of hemoglobin. Um, and this normal value is between 95 and 100. And this is actually the oxygen, the main oxygen carrying component of your blood. And lastly, base excess, if it's positive, right? So if it's, because the normal values are between positive two and negative two. So if it's negative two, then you have a negative excess, which is more accurate to say a, a deficit. So it could be a base excess or, or a base deficit. And uh, it gives you a more isolated view of the metabolic component of your acid-base status because bicarb and carbonic acid and CO2 can kind of transform in between one another. So they, they are mixed just a little bit. But this base excess is just purely looking at what component is metabolic. All right, let's step into it a little bit further and start using these values and putting it all together. Now into interpreting the ABG, and look guys, this is actually a lot easier than you think. It's super easy. There's really only two things that you need to look at. Two steps. Step one, look at the pH. Is it acidic or is it alkalotic? Let's say it's acidic. The pH is too low. Okay. Hmm. Step two. Which one of the, the two major components that we talked about, the respiratory component or the metabolic component, is responsible for that abnormal pH? I said it was acidic, so what would I expect an acidic PaCO2 to look like? Well, I would expect that to be a little bit high. If the PaCO2 is high, then it is responsible for the um, the acidic pH, and vice versa with the, the, the metabolic component. If the bicarb is too low, well then I'm gonna suspect that that is causing this acidic pH. Does that make sense? And then sometimes you might see a picture where they're both abnormal, so then you just look at which one, which one is worse, okay? And then you also look at the patient. You know, 99 times out of 100, if you look at the patient or listen to their history, you're gonna know what's happening. So let's test these two steps and practice. And I promise you guys, super easy. Let's do it. Okay, example number one. In this example, in fact, in all of my examples, I'm not even gonna give you the numbers. Why? Because you don't need the numbers. You just need to know if it's high or low. I mean, simplification here, I don't care. I just wanna know, is this patient in an alkalotic state or in an acidotic state? And in this example, the pH is high. So what does that mean? That means this is an alkalosis, right? Next, I look at the respiratory and the metabolic components, and I say, well, it looks like they're both pointing down. So which one of those is causing the alkalosis? Well, if the carbonic acid is down, that would cause an alkalosis, right? Well, there you go. That means this is a respiratory alkalosis with a metabolic compensation. See how that works? 
So there is an issue with the breathing that is causing an alkalotic state and the kidneys have started to compensate by excreting bicarb. Respiratory, alkalosis, metabolic compensation. What? Is it really that easy? Yeah, it is. It's that easy. The other stuff, I mean, who's going to pimp you about the PaO2? Who's going to pimp you about the hemoglobin? Nobody. They just want to know, can you read the acid-base disorder? The, the base excess on the end, that can come into it a little bit later. But, I mean, that's just going to kind of follow the pattern that we've already talked about. It is that easy. Let's do some more examples. Okay, using the same steps. Step one, is this alkalotic or an acidotic state? It is an acidosis or an acid, uh, acidotic state. Which of the two components is causing it? Is it respiratory or metabolic? It is respiratory. Can you see that? Can you see how there's an increase in CO2 and therefore an increase in carbonic acid causing the pH to go down? Respiratory acidosis with a metabolic compensation. Shoot, now that you're a pro, I'm just gonna let you figure this out by yourself. You can pause the video and I'll give you the answer in just a second. Did you say metabolic alkalosis with a respiratory compensation? If you did, you're right, good job. And now, the final challenge for the win, can you do it? This is a metabolic acidosis with respiratory compensation. Yes, good job, guys. Okay, so now for some real quick uh, tricks to help you out. Notice how in this example, all three arrows are pointing in the same direction. Anytime that all three, the pH, the PaCO2, and the bicarb are pointing in the same direction, either up or down, then you're looking at a metabolic problem or a metabolic component causing the acidosis or alkalosis. Prove it to yourself. Back up the video and look at the metabolic alkalosis. All three of the arrows were pointing up. Also, for the respiratory problems, the pH arrow and the other two are going to be pointing in opposite directions. That will be a respiratory alkalosis or acidosis. Pretty easy. All right, so that's just a little pointer to help you speed up a little bit. All right, guys, congratulations. You made it all the way to the end. This is your first knowledge challenge question. A 45-year-old white female is brought to the emergency department via ambulance where you are working hard as a medical student in one of your rotations. This patient has a weak pulse and she's breathing, but she's not really responsive to you. She's not, she's not perking up. You notice some dried blood and some track marks and some pitting in her antecubital fossa, which is the front of the elbow where people like to inject drugs. You suspect this is probably a narcotic overdose. Uh, what does the ABG tell you? How about I give you some arrows to help you out? Again, I'm not going to push memorizing the normal values yet. I just want you to recognize patterns. So is this an acidosis or an alkalosis? This is an acidosis. What is causing the acidosis? The respiratory component. Good. This is a respiratory acidosis because she's not breathing very much. Her breathing reflex has been subdued via the drugs. What about the compensation? Well, in this example, I didn't put the bicarb above what I consider to be a normal value. I put at the high end, but not above, because she hasn't been uh, overdosing long enough for her kidneys to compensate. But you could say that they're starting to because that value has risen. Okay, good job. Let's try the next one. Knowledge challenge number two. This one's gonna be a little bit harder because I'm not gonna give you any help. So this is a 35-year-old black male. He, he presents to you in the clinic where you're working as a student. He's obese. He's got half of a cigarette behind his right ear and, uh, I don't know, like a McDonald's bag in his left hand with it looks like there's some fries or something in there. He says he has not felt good all day, fatigued and nauseous, 
and despite drinking a, a gallon of orange juice and he knows he's getting enough fluid because he's peeing like a racehorse, he just feels so thirsty and his breath smells like nail polish remover. First of all, what does the ABG tell you? And second of all, what is his diagnosis? So the ABG tells you that this is an acidotic state caused by a metabolic process with respiratory compensation and there's even some base excess suggesting, again, metabolic issue here. This guy, he, he could be in some real trouble here. This looks to me like diabetic ketoacidosis. He needs some help, he needs some help quick. You need to get him on some fluids and get him some insulin like now. And if he's in the clinic, you need to think about maybe uh, calling an ambulance for him and getting him uh, to an ER. So if you picked metabolic acidosis, you got it. Good job. Hey YouTubers, thanks for watching this video. I really hope that you liked it. I hope that it helps you. Subscribe, give me a like, send me a comment, and uh, hang in.